pay down thousands of dollars in student debt and still start your own business? How do you boost your credit score? Or how do you just live the fabulous life, maybe travel, turn up with your friends every now and then, and still do that on a entry-level salary? Well, our guest today is the perfect person to answer these questions and many more. She is Tanya Rapley, the Millennial Money Coach, and she's been featured in media many times, including the front cover of Black Enterprise and ABC's Here and Now. She's also author of this book, The Super Fab Financial Planner. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, I, I met you at Beauties and Brains Behind the Brands, and I was so inspired by your story. Tell us Thank how you... you got into financial education in the first place? Financial education, I would say, almost happened by accident for me. Mm -hmm. um, nothing is really an accident, but right. I always tell people, and every time I speak, I tell people I'm the least likely person to become a financial educator. Um, growing up, I struggled with math. I hated it. I avoided it mm -hmm. even through college. <laughs> so I got a degree. I, when I chose my major, I looked through the catalog to see which program required the least amount of math. <laughs> I was like, that's me right there. Right. Um, and so I, you know, that worked for a while. And then um, I moved to New York City and I took a position working at low income housing with women who were in their 50s and 60s. Um, and some of them even older. Some of them, um, you know, that was her last home. Mm -hmm. um, and I just saw what happened when you plan for your future versus mm -hmm. when you didn't plan for your future. Right. And I realized that I had to change my financial situation or I was going to end up unprepared for my retirement. Mm -hmm. And so I started out with my credit because yeah. credit was something I had been sweeping under the rug. And at that time, I wanted my own apartment and a few other things that you needed good credit for. And so I started with my credit, and wow. it just grew from there. Um, right. Then I started saving more, then I started investing, uh -huh. and it just went from there. Okay, what was, ha what was happening? Why was your credit not where it should have been? My credit was subpar. I mean, a lot of it was because of my own decisions, mm -hmm. but also in college I was in an abusive relationship, mm -hmm. and there was economic abuse present in that relationship. Right. And so it manifested its way, and it manifests its way different in any situation where there's abuse. Um, but in that situation, I was the one taking on all the responsibility. Mm -hmm. right. I was the one paying all the bills. I was the one also um, putting things in their name. Oh, wow. And wow. Um, oh. when we decided to go our separate ways, you know, I didn't have anything. I barely had money to leave him. Oh, and, wow. um, you know, it broken leases, um, oh, utility wow. bills unpaid that he promised that he would pay. Wow. Um, scams he concocted oh my God. while we were together um, yeah. and so there was just this entire mess to clean up that I ignored for a long time but when I started my journey I had to address that mess right right well I'm glad that you're mentioning that because how big of a role does your partner pay, play in your economic stability uh, I, I think that that's an, a mistake that a lot of people make is they don't realize that I mean, of course you should love someone before you get married to them, mm -hmm. but it's also, it's one of the biggest financial decisions you will ever make right. when you're choosing a partner, a long-term partner for that, who you intend to create a, you know, a family with and, mm -hmm. you know, have a future with, because if you aren't on the same page financially, then that can be to your detriment. Right. You know, if there's someone in, you're in a relationship with someone who ignores their credit and has no intent to improve their credit, mm -hmm. um, then you're the one increasing your debt to income ratio and taking on large amounts of debt right. while they're just over here chilling, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and they can't even co-sign on anything. Right. Um, and that, I, I've seen it in situations where, you know, the family, the couple wants to get a house, but they can't because all of the credit is in her name and all the debt is in her name and she's the only one who has decent credit. And wow it's not possible right um so it's extremely important and i think that people are uncomfortable having conversations about money mm -hmm. and whether it's a significant other or friends mm -hmm. but it's one of those conversations especially if you're going to be joining forces it's one of those conversations that have to be had right so i mean if someone has poor credit lots of debt should you put your lives together that way that's i mean it's a it's a question if they have a plan okay. and if they are okay. willing to work that plan. There's a lot of people who will sit down and do a plan and mm -hmm. not be willing to work their plan. Right. So if they're willing to work their plan, then definitely. 
because, um, I mean, my significant other, when we got together, his credit wasn't the most amazing. It was not impressive. I was not with him because of his credit score. Um, and we said, I sat down, I was like, you know, this is important to me it, and showed him how important it was to us as a unit. Right. And we put his plan together and now his credit is, his credit score is higher than mine. Yeah. He said that he was definitely, definitely a bragging about it. Like, <laughs> hey, my life. Uh-huh. but I mean, I think it is important. Um, it, it's just important to have someone who's willing mm-hmm. to make the changes and is on the same financial plan. It's not helpful if, you know, the person feels like you're forcing them into that. They have to willingly want to change their situation right. and want more for their finances. Or maybe you're just not equally yoked when it comes to finances. Right. Um, and, and don't ignore it. Right, exactly. It is a deal breaker, folks. It really is. It is. Yeah. It really is a deal breaker. A lot of families and a lot of marriages end in divorce because of financial matters. I mean, think about it. When are you the most stressed? When your money is not right. <laughs> exactly. And so as a couple, if your money isn't right, then you can't even focus on loving each other and everything because right. you're just so frustrated with your financial situation. Yes. Yes. Speaking of frustration, I'm going to go on to debt, especially student loan debt. It is staggering. The average person graduates with about $26,000 worth of debt. Yeah. What do you do? Like, how do you start paying that off, you know, if you're not yeah. making a whole lot of money? Um... See, it depends on, like, what your priorities are. I always tell people it depends on what your priorities are because at minimum, I want people, if someone is not able to make their regular payment, I want them to focus on being able to make a regular payment and then focus on paying their student loan debt off. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Yeah, so st- let's start with baby steps. So it mm-hmm. doesn't, because sometimes with something like student loan debt, it can seem impossible and people become yeah. um, discouraged and they're just like, forget it all. Yeah, you're like, I, I, I can't, handle it. I can't mm. forget it all. Right. And so, but it, it is important, for, especially in places in New York City where it's more difficult to get a mortgage, it's important to maintain positive payment history with your student loans because that is going to be the largest debt on your credit report and companies. We'll look at that and treat that as, you know, a debt comparable to a car payment or a mortgage payment. So it's extremely important for people to realize that they have to pay on time. Um, Private and federal loans are different and understanding the nuances between those are important. But I know a lot of companies offer a pay what you can afford plan, essentially, an income-based repayment plan, IBR. Mm -hmm. Um, I know the federal government refers to them as IBRs. And it's just important to do what you can initially, and then once you're able, hopefully you get a better-paying job. But once you get a better-paying job, don't use that extra money to buy more stuff. To turn up. To turn (laughs) up, to, like, fill your apartment or fill your place with things that you are not going to even want in a year. Use that extra income to double down on your student loan payments and start making a dent. Um, But don't ignore it while you're making um, a lower salary. And if you are, if your salary is less because you work for a nonprofit organization, Mm -hmm. make sure that you are registered for the loan forgiveness program. Because once you make 10 years worth of payments, 120 consecutive payments, your student loan is forgiven. What? If you work for a nonprofit organization, if you work for a city agency or like the government or anything of that nature, Uh your student loans are forgiven. Wow. Wow. So if you're a career teacher and you pay your loans for 120 payments straight or 10 years, then, you know, your loans are forgiven. Yes, that is a beautiful thing. Yeah, Yeah. it is. (laughs) It is. And so it's just important to know what's out there. The information is free. It's available. Mm -hmm. um, And it's most valuable to you because it's your situation. Right. So you have to be eager to see what's out there to help you out. Exactly. Exactly. That's good information. Well, you kind of touched upon it already, but your credit score. Mm -hmm. Credit score sagging, you can't get a mortgage, you can't get a car loan, you can't do a whole lot of things. How do you boost that? So boosting your score, I think that there's a lot of emphasis on like these companies that clean up credit. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, you do want to, if there are any errors on your credit report that you're not responsible for, you definitely want those off your report. You don't want to be paying for stuff that you have nothing to do with. Right, exactly. Um, But also in the same instance, the importance of maintaining open accounts and positive standing. Mm. Credit, your credit score is generated by your positive pay, by your payments. Right. Um, There's a lot of other things that go into play, such as the amount of debt that you carry on a particular account, Mm -hmm. the age of the account, um, and a few other factors. But the most important thing is to remember to pay on time and try to keep that balance low. So if you have a credit card, keeping that balance below 30%. 
So say you have a thousand dollar credit card, you don't want your balance to go any higher than three hundred dollars, right? Um, because anything higher than that, especially fifty and up, it starts to signal to the credit card companies that this person might be in financial stress yes, and over their head, and then they don't want to issue new credit to you because right. that's you know they want to make sure you can pay it back. So the most important thing t that people can do is pay on time and keep balances low, right? And that that helps with improving your credit score. I've seen people who've had foreclosures on their credit report but by paying off a single card every single month by putting just like a gym membership on there something that's mm -hmm. 10 20 dollars a magazine subscription something that's relatively small or netflix you know right, right, netflix right. membership right. um just putting something mm -hmm. like that on and paying it off every single month that starts to churn positive payment history oh, wow. into okay. your credit score Okay, that's a really simple thing that but people that can start doing. Yeah. Doesn't mean like let everything else go haywire. <laughs> but that's um, that it's is. Not that you have to say that, but yes, because you're like, well, I paid my Netflix account this month. <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. Right. It, but it is if, if you do that along with minding your other financial business and trying to keep everything else in good standing, you'll start to see your score increase. Okay, so you know we're talking about you know scores and all that and stuff and small salaries. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, you know what, I would save if I only I was making more money. So how do you save money when you're not making enough money? First thing is you make it a priority. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many times where people, and I was guilty of this too. I was, I was, I had an AmeriCorps position when I first started at my job, oh, okay. and so that meant I was making like thirteen thousand dollars. Wow, that is a not year <laughs> in New, in, in Brooklyn. New York City, like how yes. did you do that? Barely. <laughs> um, um, but one of the things that me and my friend sat down and we both went on an eating out fast. Mm -hmm. And her and I were just like, you know, we're going to cook all our meals. The only way that we are going to dine out is if someone else is covering the bill. Whether it's a friend <laughs> wants to do it, whether a job uh, wants to do it, whoever, we just aren't covering it. Right. And I ended up finding more room in my budget as a result of that. Oh, I can't wow. tell you what I spent it on because it was pre <laughs> my fat finance. But I found more room in my budget by right. doing that. And so it really is making saving a priority and figuring out what you can eliminate, right. what you don't need in your life, what's not a necessity, or what you can pull back on. Say you're spending $100 a month on brunch. Take out, you know, give yourself an allowance of $40 a month on brunch and use that other 60 to contribute to a savings account. You know, $50 is mm -hmm. it's a start. You know, right. we don't always have to have these large audacious goals even and though I they're think that's amazing. what a lot of people think like yeah. it has to be big or like if I can't put 500 in it I'm not putting it. no every, you have to you can start small and build your way up like right. build your your savings muscle um, you can have a large goal in mind but also remember you know large goals are achieved by small steps often yeah, exactly. and so it's a matter of just doing something like that and contributing an additional fifty dollars a month. And I mean, you're making a great point because your book points this out. You have to, in order to save, you have to know what you're spending. And so it's yes. great, like you have in this everything that you're spending, put everything down in here, so you know, so then you can actually cut things out because you know yes. what where it's going. In that, in in yeah. the um, book, I intentionally put an expense tracker in there mm -hmm. because like you said a lot of times we don't know what we spent our money on how right. many times have you looked at your bank statement and be like where what? That? <laughs> where did it go you know it, exactly. it, it happens like that so it's right. really important to you know even if you're not writing it down after you make the purchase immediately in the morning when you get up you know reflect on your bank account i always tell people check your primary account balance every morning mm -hmm. um i know there's a lot of tools out here that will send you an alert, uh, an alert or whatever but I found I discovered that I was being wrongly charged twenty dollars a month what? just a couple of weeks ago what? or something. And the first time it happened, I was like, maybe that was like I, <laughs> I don't know what that was. Yeah. But the second month it happened, I said, no, this is the same exact charge, and I called them immediately, and they reversed it. Right. And so it's just important to know what's happening with your account, but also checking in on how you're spending and what you're doing mm -hmm. because you might realize, oh my gosh, I spent sixty dollars last week right. on food. And I have groceries in my house. Right. So, <laughs> like, what am I doing? Yeah. What? So exactly. it's it's an opportunity to kind of check yourself where you are, mm -hmm. um, regroup, and plan to make the rest of the month even better. Right. Exactly. So let's talk investments for a moment, because okay. I think a lot of people investments are like this mystical, magical thing that they don't know anything about. Really. Uh -huh. So what what are the types of things that people can invest in in terms of different types? investments I mean the first thing that every that most people who have a traditional nine to five have at their disposal is a 401k mm -hmm. that's the first and the easiest thing to do 
Now, a financial plan or a retirement strategy should consist of more than a 401k, but for a lot of people, if your company matches or they contribute automatically for you, you're missing the opportunity of, to get free money towards your retirement. Right. So that's the first thing. And always then, match. Like, always. Right. Or, you know, go above and beyond if you can. If you can, max it out. Um, but it's really important to make sure, first and foremost, you're taking advantage of that because often there's free money on yeah. the table for you with that. The next thing is look into something that's not as high risk mm -hmm. if you are uncomfortable. So that could mm -hmm. be um, mutual funds. Mutual funds are a great product for people who are not as savvy with investing. Um, stocks aren't for everybody, even though it's more you volatile, can, right? They're more volatile, and they're, they say the stocks are better for younger investors mm -hmm. um, because of their vo um, volatility, because they're so volatile. Right. Um, so I, always, I also recommend that people, if you are not comfortable with doing it, get the help of a financial advisor. Right. Um, I even have a financial advisor. Right. I did what I could, mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I talk about credit and debt, and I, if I can be honest, as a financial educator that I needed assistance, mm -hmm. there's nothing to be ashamed of talking to someone right. who can help you grow your money. So I have a financial advisor and we were able to sit down and discuss my goals and everything. Mm -hmm. And contrary to popular belief, financial advisors are not expensive. Oh, a lot of people okay. assume they are, oh, but okay. my financial advisor works on contingency. So mm -hmm. he makes a percentage based on the money that he earns for me. And that's See, a win-win. Like yeah, we're is... both motivated <laughs> to make money. Like that's a win-win for me. Right. Um, but there's also um, a where did great, you find him? I um, I ask around for referrals. Okay. So you can't just go with everybody. You can't go with the person you see on Instagram that claims that they're a you know a broker. You you can't go with everybody because as Bernie Madoff taught us that yeah. like everybody's yeah. not you know mm -hmm. on the up and up. So you ask around. Um, you can look on there's uh, the accrediting websites. You can check with them to okay. see what um, financial advisors are there. Um, companies such as Prudential, traditional. I don't want to endorse any particular company, but a lot of these financial services companies out here, such as Allstate, Prudential, um, State Farm, they have agents that can help you with retirement planning. And um, lastly, there are a lot of nonprofit resources that are available. Mm, okay. A lot of people aren't aware here in Brooklyn. Their organization, Bridge Street Development Corporation, they have a an investors for investing for a beginners course that they're starting in the next few weeks. Wow! Okay. And um, they'll match you, so you have to contribute your own seven hundred and fifty dollars, mm -hmm. and they'll match you seven hundred and fifty dollars, and you'll walk through what? this course for six weeks, and then at the end of the course, you'll have an advisor to help you decide how to invest that money. What? Okay. And yes. it's you know yes. it's it's free. You <laughs> just have to bring it. your money to the table. Um, you have to have proof that you have the seven hundred fifty dollars to put up for. You can't go through the course and at the end be like, like, I don't have any yeah. money. <laughs> I just want to learn. No, it doesn't work <laughs> like that. Um, but there are so many great resources. Bridge Street's not the only one that does it. Other nonprofits across the city do it. I think that it's probably a grant that a lot of the larger banks get. Right. So they fund these through nonprofit organizations. And I don't think it's unique to New York. So right. I, if someone has family outside of New York City, mm -hmm. they can inquire, they have mm -hmm. them ask around and see what they have. Exactly, yeah, it's yeah. Not, it's not, it doesn't have to be so mystical, folks. You can it's do this. Not, it's it's yeah. really not. There are so many people who've made a lot of money in real estate mm -hmm. um, or just investing, and it's not that they, they're they more capable mm -hmm. than us. It's just a matter of they made it a priority right. to learn and get good at it. Right, exactly. So talk about priorities and whatnot. I met you at the Beauties and Brains, Behind the Brands event, and you are an entrepreneur. So for the person at home who has that nine to five job and they have this great idea, uh -huh. like how did you know that it was time to step out on your own and do your own business? My aha moment, I would say it was a chain of things that happened. But for me, the final straw was I started working with Rush Card. Um, I'm their financial educator for their clients and I blog for them and write for them and do videos for them and I had interviewed Russell Simmons that day mm. um, and I had to go back to my nine to five <laughs> and, you and were like, I was like don't yeah no um, and at that time I was really using my nine to five as a clutch because my fat finance uh, I had a friend who told me a few maybe last year and she said my fat finance will grow when you give it a hundred percent and it's, it wow. was growing, and then that's what I started doing. Wow. I started giving it 100% despite having a 9 to 5, and I was exhausted. 
and I started seeing the returns on it, but I was okay. balancing too. So I know I didn't just leave. I did not resign just because I interviewed Russell Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> I had resigned because it was a series of opportunities that um, had come across my plate and I was financially prepared. And really, I was financially comfortable. I, I could do right. it. Right. Um, but early on, I knew that I wanted to transition. So I started putting away money that I was making from my fat finance into what I call my emergency flight fund. Mm, and so okay. even now, I do not plan to touch that fund. I have money that I'm generating from the business, and that is just there, and I plan to continue to grow it. Right. But I have that cushion just in case. That makes so much sense. Emergency flight plan, I like that. Is it a, it's a separate bank account. Yes. It is, that's another thing. People, if you have a large financial goal, if you feel like you're continuously compromising your savings account, mm -hmm. get a savings account that's online or not connected to your primary savings account. So good. good it's advice. Make your money inconvenient. Yeah. Take yourself out of the equation. And so my money is that one sits in the online savings account and it's not connected to my primary checking account. Um, only if I want to transfer money back and forth, it takes about two to three days. Okay. Yeah. Like they orange, like you can do something like orange or any one of the non brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. type of orange places. simple capital mm -hmm. one has one. I think capital one is formerly ING. Um, American right. express has a savings account. A lot of them, you know, credit unions, a lot of them have the, the option available. Right. Right. So I wanted to say the best for last your book, the super fab financial planner. Tell people what they can find in here. This is my baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a lot of love put into this planner. Mm -hmm. And um, the planner, it starts, one of my favorite features of it is the gratitude journal. Because I mm -hmm. think it's really important for people to reflect on what they're thankful for. Okay. Um, a lot of times we're like, when I make more or do have more, you know, I'll be happy. And that's not the case. Right. It's a matter of, I, I think that, hap I, I know happiness is a state of mind mm -hmm. and so it doesn't matter what you have in your wallet if you're not happy and grateful for what you have you'll never have enough mm -hmm. so I have the gratitude journal in there that's my favorite one and you do it monthly um, a debt repayment plan form mm -hmm. so there's a, so there's a few uh, sheets in here so you can write down important information such as your terms your interest rates things that you commonly would forget but are very important when you're considering which debt to prioritize um, and then you write down in here, you know, if you can increase your payment once one has been paid off, you can chart that here. And you would go with the, like, highest interest rate one first, right, you, to pay off. It depends. Um, it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. Because for some people, it is the highest interest rate. But if your highest interest rate one is your highest balance, some people might need to start with their lowest balance to, we call it the snowball effect. Mm -hmm. So you start with your low, your smallest balance so you can, you know, knock that out the way so that's okay. not nagging at you. And then you can take everything that you have to knock down the large okay. interest rate. Um, but another thing to do that people can consider if they have a credit card and they have fairly decent credit card, um, credit a fairly decent credit score is to transfer that to a zero balance a zero interest card right so that you don't have that high interest rate and you can focus on the smaller debts and then take care of the bigger debt before right. the interest rate um, exits the introductory period right so that's okay. something people can consider doing nice. um, and then there's just so many other goodies in here you I have meditations every month yes I where I talk about things such as impulse buying leasing versus buying a car I'm um, just the common questions that people ask when it pertains to finance um, and I created it so that it's open-ended, the months. So there's not a January, February, exactly. March. It's month one, month two, month three. Even if you put it away mm -hmm. and pick it, you start on month one and you put it away and want to pick it up two months later, you can. Right. Because it's, you don't feel crazy because you're like, <laughs> oh, my God, I miss all these months. You can start where you were because um, you fill in the calendar. It has a monthly calendar in it so that people can write down their um, due dates or any important things that you need to know that are going to pertain to your finances. Okay. So I wanted it to be a beautiful way to organize your finances. It is, and it is. And I, um, I write everything down. Mm -hmm. And I know some people are like that. I just can't get with online apps. Right. Um, budgeting app. I need to write everything down and right. erase and everything with pen and pencil. Um, so that's why I created this for people who excel in budgeting that way. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Well, thank you so much, Tanya, thank for you. joining us. This was wonderful, very informative. You can check out more with Tanya Rapley on her website, myfabfinance.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.